Right, Gary. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see you again on this Wednesday evening. Uh, and I'm particularly excited this weekend, though I get excited every week, uh, because we have with us Roger Fernandez, who is a Native American artist, storyteller, and educator. His work focuses on the culture and arts of the Coast Salish tribes of Western Washington, and he is himself a member of the Lower Elwas Glalam tribe. He's worked in a variety of arenas, including Native education, social work, arts, and culture. He's also a practicing artist who teaches Coast Salish design and a storyteller, as we are going to find out shortly, which is part of why I'm excited because that's my field of study as well. Some of the most interesting conversations I've had in the last year have been a pair with Roger about storytelling and why it matters, but also connected to our earlier sessions, I think, Roger has been instrumental in the development and implementation of the Since Time Immemorial Tribal Sovereignty in Western in the Washington State Curriculum that is now in fact being, I think, implemented or is on the verge of being implemented in Washington State Schools. So welcome with a great round of applause for Roger. I put my hands up like this. Um, the native tribes of this area in a gathering, you see their hands going up all the time like this. This gesture, uh, is a very powerful, positive social gesture. It means hello. It means goodbye. It means thank you. It means you're welcome. And so whenever something needs to be acknowledged, I put my hands up like this. And after a while, it just feels natural. It just feels like such a good thing to do because you're honoring people by this gesture. Um, I was taught that uh, it has one symbolic meaning. You lift me up. You lift me up. You lift up my heart. You make me happy. So again, uh, thank you for inviting me to be in your class today. And uh, as a storyteller, it's pretty simple. Um, reading and writing have not been around that long in human history. Um, and so, because we all have grown up with it, we assume that it's just been here forever, but it hasn't. It's been a relatively recent um, uh, human technological development, taking sounds that we make, creating words and thoughts, putting them together, and then writing them down. And so, um, uh, reading and writing are powerful but um, uh, the stories did all of this work before there was reading and writing. So uh, uh, I'll mention a book if you all are interested. There's a wonderful book called Orality, Orality and Literacy. It's about um, the place of the spoken, remembered word and stories, how we share via that method of using our voice and our memory and our heart um, versus the written word. And the author, I thought, was very... Um, what would you call it, uh, even-handed in his approach, but he was driven by a question. I use it in, as, a, as a, uh, a required reading in my, my class on storytelling. Um, the book was written on a premise that uh, he said that it, if you meet someone during the course of your day, any modern adult, if you meet someone in the course of your day, a man or woman or whoever it is, and you meet them, and in talking with them, they reveal to you that they can't read and write. They don't know how to read and write. He said, what would your feeling about that person be? What would your judgment be? And most of us are just conditioned. What's wrong with this person? Why, why can't they read and write? What, what's going on here? He really said, what is it about reading and writing that they become a value that we place upon other people, that it's become a measure of other people? And I found that an interesting question because as a storyteller, I don't rely on reading and writing. I rely on my memory and the voice of my teachers, the voice of my ancestors. And I carry the story in here and here, of course, but I carry it in here. I know these stories by heart. And um, so I don't have to think about them. I just tell the stories. They, they flow out of me. They flow from my heart, my memory. And then I realized as time went on that storytelling is, if you know stories by heart, that means it is in your heart. It is now a part of you. And so we all carry stories. We all carry stories. And what stories do you carry, each one of you? What stories do you carry that your culture has taught you? that helps you understand some things that are very powerful um, um, combinations of feelings and memories and emotions and, uh, and uh, your spirit and your brain, that these mythic stories that we call them uh, speak a whole different language. So I'm gonna share a mythic story with you from people of this land. I'm gonna share why it's, well, 
I want to start with a shorter story first, because I want you to get the idea of how storytelling can be. Storytelling, I was taught by my elders many 30, 40 years ago, storytelling is teaching, storytelling is healing. Those two things storytelling can provide for us. Um, so let me tell you a story that comes from this area, the Puget Sound region, where we are Coast Salish people. My tribe is Lower Elwa, Anuxglayam, um, called the Klallam people by the English speakers. And we are a Coast Salish tribe. So uh, a lot of the things that we share um, in our tribe, in our village, in our bands of our people, they are also carried by many tribes all around us. So um, the Coast Salish people, like the Duwamish, Snoqualmie, now the Muckleshoot, and the uh, Suquamish, um, they're all Coast Salish people, my tribe, the Lower Elwa Klallam people. So um, I'm going to share a story with you that um, in telling you this story, I'm going to teach you something. But I'm not like kind of a modern teacher where you have to complete a paper or, or uh, 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 take a test and get a passing grade on the test to prove that you know what I told you. Storytelling is a different kind of teaching. It speaks to in my opinion, the, the totality of who you are. It speaks to many levels of who you are. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a story that is pretty simple. Let's see, I'm gonna try to tell a story where I don't have to rely on too much movement because you wouldn't be able to see some of the things. Um, this story is about salmon. And uh, if you know the tribes of this region and all up and down the Northwest coast, you know that salmon um, is the most important being in the world. It is a powerful being, much more than a fish that swims in the water we catch and we eat. Salmon gives life to everyone, everything. I mean, think of all the things here that eat salmon. People eat salmon, seals eat salmon, whales eat salmon, eagles eat salmon, bears eat salmon, ravens eat salmon. I could go on and on and on and on with plants and uh, insects and other fish that rely on salmon for food, for life. So salmon give life to everyone. And we call salmon the salmon people. Ubul is one of the names, salmon people. And um, this is the belief of the people that's shared in our mythical stories that salmon are really people like us who live in villages under the ocean. And at a certain time of the year, they put on salmon skin and become salmon. They change from people into salmon. Then they come back up the rivers to be the people in the land. So we call them the salmon people, the ones who live in the villages under the ocean who become salmon, put on salmon skin, and they come to feed us, to give us food so we can have life. They feed the very earth itself. So that's the salmon people. And to honor the salmon people, because we must, they give us such a powerful gift. Um, many tribes have many things that they do. In my tribe and other tribes around us, we take the salmon bones. After we're done eating the salmon, a lot of bones left, right? And we put the salmon bones back in the water. We don't just throw them away. And that is because we believe that the salmon will use those bones to come back again. They'll regenerate, come back again. So to honor the salmon, we put those salmon bones back in the water. So now you know about the uh, salmon people, and now you know about why we put the salmon bone back in the water. Now, a lot of times, depending on the culture you're speaking to, if it's your culture, you don't have to explain a lot of stuff. Um, but sometimes if you're hearing from another culture, what I just did was try to help orient you to the story, to tell you a little bit so you can understand the story as it progresses. So um, uh, most storytellers don't worry about trying to do that. But again, I'm trying to make sure if this story is going to work, you have to understand certain things. Uh, there's a thing called high context and low context. Um, high context, if I remember it right, says, I need to know more about this culture. I, I don't really understand it that well. Tell me some more about them so I can understand their stories or understand them better. Low context means, hey, I know these people pretty good and uh, they eat the same food I eat and they live in cities like me. And so therefore you don't have to tell me a lot about them. So I just told you a little bit about the salmon people and putting the bones back in the water. So now here, after all of that is the story. A long time ago in a village, not far from here, there lived a little boy. And this little boy was a really, really, really bad little boy. He was a really bad little boy. He was always lying and cheating and stealing and fighting. He was always complaining, talking back to the grown-up, disrespectful to the elders, mean to the little kids. Oh, this little boy was really, really bad. Well, in this village, it was a job of the children to take the salmon bones back to the water. And the grandpa said, all you children come here. Take the salmon bones back to the water, all of you. And all the children ran up, picked up handfuls of bones. They walked out the door, going down the trail to the river. 
put the salmon bones back to the water. All, all of them were doing this except one. And you know who that one, right? That one was that mean, rotten little boy. He said, Grandpa, leave me alone. I'll do that another time. Grandpa said, it's a very simple thing. This is how we show respect to the salmon people. Do it now. Was well, it all right? And he went to where the pile of salmon bones had been, but they were pretty much all gone except for like a handful. So he scooped up that handful of bones and he walked out the door, following the other children to the river to put the salmon bone back in the water. And he was walking really slow. And pretty soon he couldn't see anybody and nobody was around. So he threw the salmon bones in the bushes. He said, there, no one will ever know. And then he went back home. Well, a few days later, that boy was playing on some big rocks by the side of the river. And accidentally he slipped and he fell into the river, the deepest part of the river. And he would have drowned, except under the water, someone saved him. The salmon people saved him. And they took him back to their village under the ocean and they took very good care of him. They're very kind and loving. They gave him good food. They gave him warm blankets. All he had to do all day long was run around the village playing with the salmon children. So that little boy said, I love it here. They're so nice to me. I, I'm going to stay here forever. I will never leave. I love living with the salmon people. But one day something happened that changed everything. One day he was playing with, a little, with, a, with all the little children. They were all playing and, and, the, and running around the village. And he saw a little girl, a little salmon girl. And she was trying to run too. But one leg she was dragging behind herself like she was limping. And, and it, it looked like it hurt when she tried to run on this leg. She was dragging behind her. It looked as though she had no bones in her leg. She would try to play catch, but one arm she couldn't lift up. And it looked like it hurt when she tried to lift up this arm. It looked as though... She had no bones in her arm. And right away, that little boy knew what happened. He knew what happened. The bones he threw away like, like garbage, they never made it back to the salmon people. And now this little girl was suffering. She was in pain because of him. And the little boy knew this. He had to do something. So he went to the salmon people and he said, can you take me back to my village on the land? I have important things to tell them there. And the salmon people said, yes, we can take you back to your village on the land. But if you leave, you may never come back again. You'll be gone forever. And the boy thought, he said, it's very important. I must go. And so the salmon people took that boy back to his village, the water right by his village. And the boy was walking out of the water. He came walking out of the water. And his people saw him coming out of the water. And they were so shocked and surprised. They they thought they would never see him again because he fell in the water in the river. and they, they thought he was gone forever, but here he was returning to them. So they rushed up to hug that boy and to greet him. But the boy said, wait, wait, I have important things to tell you. First, that spoiled, rotten, mean little boy that you used to know, that is not me anymore. I have changed. I am a good person now. And must tell you what I've learned. The things we do on the land affect the things that live in the water. The things we do on the land affect the things that live in the water. We must respect and protect the house of the salmon people. We must respect and protect the house of the salmon people. And this is what that little boy taught his people from the time he lived with the salmon people in their villages under the ocean. And that is all. That story is called Salmon Boy. And so I told you that story for a reason. I wanted to teach you something. But again, the storyteller's job is not to tell you the story and then teach you what the story means. The storyteller's job is just to tell the story. You know your work has begun now. What does that story mean to me? What did I learn? Why did they do this? Why didn't they do that? Have I ever done anything like this? You begin to question things about this story that might help you understand there's something within this story that you can learn. So. Um, I'm not quite sure how we do this. Uh, if we're on Zoom, if, if there's a way to share either with chat or I don't know if the uh, instructor can um, um, select anyone that might have their hand up. Did anyone learn something in this story? And there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm not looking for the right answer. I'm looking for your answer. What you learned because of your life, your perspective, your gender, your class, whatever it is, race, whatever it is, you learned something from this story that I can't learn because 
I don't fulfill the same categories that you belong to. So, and you don't fulfill the categories I belong to. So maybe if we share what we see in the story, we can teach each other something, help each other understand each other. And so this story is told by the native people to their children, to the whole community for a reason. We want the people to know the lessons they might find within this story. But what are, what, what's a lesson in there that you might point to? So again, for me, um, um, I'll ask the instructor if there's a process that they can uh, give some feedback or we can maybe save that to the end if people have comments or thoughts. Uh, I'd be happy to work with you to make sure they feel they have a voice in this because that's really what I'm aiming for is that whatever you find in the story came from your own being, your own brain and, and, and emotions and heart and spirit and psyche, all those things, the answer came from you. I would love to hear some immediate reactions and we can do both. You can put up the, as before, raise hand function and we'll call on you and boom, they're showing up in chat already. I don't know if you can see the chat, uh, Roger, or if you want me to read that. Okay, hold on. Cool, all right. Sacrifice. Ah, yes, yes. He did. Uh, he wanted to stay there forever, but he had to make a choice. And I choose to do the right, what he believed to be the right thing, which meant he had to leave the salmon people. The thing he wanted, he gave up for the sake of others. Self-sacrifice. Wonderful. And again, a very simple statement, right? The things we do on the land affect the things that live in the water. And we're learning more and more and more how powerful that is in the environments we live in. If we pollute the rivers, if we pollute the street, uh, the stormwater, the drain goes down the drains, ultimately it's going to end up in the house of the salmon people. And the one about people can change, that's what I want you to think about. This little boy in the beginning of the story was a mean, rotten, terrible little boy. But at the end of the story, he identified himself, I'm a good person now. So he changed from a bad person to a good person. Just put it simply as a child might. But how did he make that transformation? What led to him making that change? And that's right. People can change. And there are consequences. Wonderful. Little decisions have big impacts. Wonderful. Um, so for me, then, all of you are on the right track in terms of this is what I learned in the story. This is what I learned in the story. And um, respect for tradition and to learn from the elders the grandpa was trying to teach him something. So again, this story allows us an insight to that community, that culture. Just as the um, intro I gave about this is the salmon people and this is the uh, um, um, way we respect the salmon people by putting their bones back in the water. Again, looking at a culture then that believes salmon are beings like us, which means there's a uh, a species equality that we're all, all of us are equal, all the animals, all the plants, everything is equal, that we're only part of this. In my opinion, having grown up in Western culture and learned a lot of what they always taught in the schools and in the culture itself, um, um, the model that humans, Western humans seem to operate by is we're at the top of some kind of pyramid and we're the top, we're the apex, we're just the, 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 uh, the reason everything exists is around us and for us. And so everything else beneath us, all the way down to slugs and ants and, and weeds, they're less than us. They're not even worthy of our attention. And so a native view of the world is, because we see it and hear it in our stories, that everything has power, everything is equal. And so therefore that idea of the salmon, and actually in some cases, animals like salmon, um, wolves, uh, trees like cedar tree and nettle plant, um, they have some qualities that we can't match. They're powerful. And some of the things they can do, uh, we're in awe of, we have respect for. And so again, that idea that um, there's a wonderful book I read recently, a friend loaned it to me called Ishmael, a gorilla teaching a human how to uh, save the world. And he said, well, look at the story you tell yourself, the gorilla is telling this guy, look at you're in the center, your story, you're the center. Western culture is a center, Western humans are the center of all things. And as long as you believe you're the center of this instead of just a part of it, then this destruction will continue. And so again, um, it, was a, it was a wonderful way for the gorilla to teach this guy because let's look at your stories. What stories does your culture tell you? Um, so again, looking at this story, you learn some insights about the culture that shares that story. Where the stories come from, um, 
again, it depends if you're, you know, following a Western model of human development in terms of story and language and, and uh, philosophy and things like that, or you're looking at a native view, um, which is that the stories are akin to dreams. Maybe they came out of dreams. Maybe they came from um, women working together, sharing stories, and these stories became more and more elaborate as they did this. Um, men also could do it, but women um, being the centers of most cultures um, were able to share the depth of that culture, the meaning of that culture, the structure of that culture through the stories that they would tell their children. So um, there's just all kinds of you know, uh, ideas that can stem out of this one little story. This one little story, you can talk about philosophy, you can talk about environment, about salmon, you can talk about um, uh, human transformation, you can talk about all kinds of things. But for me then, um, you must be willing to, there's a thing in film called suspension of disbelief, where when you go to a movie, and I haven't been to a movie in two years, so it's kind of weird, but if you go to a movie, um, everything about the movie can be challenged from the fact that these are flickering light images and shadow images on the wall and why should I pay attention to them all the way to, you know, you can't fly into the sun because you'll burn up, you know, halfway there or whatever it is, your brain will tear a story apart. But I believe the stories really come, these type of stories and mythic stories that all cultures tell, they come somewhere akin to here, the same place dreams come from and music and art, they come from that place that um, its role has been diminished in the modern world, in my opinion. So these stories then, they sound like dreams sometimes. That story about salmon boy might have sounded more like a dream than what we might call a real story. But that is fine because it's speaking, it's in a whole nother language about transformation, about a person who now becomes a teacher of his people and wants to bring important messages to them. Um, all the way to uh, the salmon people, their kindness to the boy, their generosity to the boy. And that's the ideal. We want to be like them. We want to live a wonderful, um, within a wonderful culture in a village that will take care of other people, even strangers to us will take care of them. So again, there are all kinds of paths you can follow in following a story. Now I'm going to take you to a, a story that comes from around here too, Puget Sound, Coast Salish, sometimes we call Puget Salish. Salish is the uh, language family that encompasses all the tribal languages around here. There are many, many tribal languages in Puget Sound and in Western Washington and Vancouver Island, Western Vancouver Island, excuse me, Eastern Vancouver Island, um, British Columbia. There's a lot of languages and um, they're all called Salish because they trace themselves back to a, 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 a central language. And so we're the Salish speakers who live by the salt water. So we're called Coast Salish. And um, we're connected through language. We're also connected through trade and family and marriage. Um, a lot of things connect us, but uh, each tribe is distinct and they have their own um, um, language and they have their own meanings behind their story. But I'm gonna tell you a story that, um, uh, I'll just tell it to you. It's an to me, it's an interesting story. Again, what does the story teach? What do you learn? So a long time ago, one year, one winter, a snow came that people had never seen before. It snowed day after day after day. Now the weather was freezing, snowing more and more, day after day, snowing and snowing and snowing, building every day. Not just a, a day or two like it might now, but it was, a, it was just snowing constantly for many, many days. And the snow covered the people. The snow covered their houses. The snow covered the trees. The snow even covered the mountains. So the world was covered in snow. And it was very hard in the people. They were trapped in their homes. They were trapped in their houses. They couldn't leave. And, and they couldn't go hunting and fishing and gathering. They had to stay in their houses, surviving off of the food they had stored for the winter. And so they say the only way the people helped each other, was able to survive, was they dug tunnels between the house through the snow. They dug tunnels to each other's house so they could help each other. Well, finally, spring came and that snow melted. And the snow melted and it was finally gone. And the people came walking out of their houses and they looked at each other and they realized they had been starving for the last few weeks of this time they'd been snowed in their village. And, and they looked like walking skeletons. You could see their bones under their skin. They were so hungry. They were so emaciated. They were so, they looked terrible. They looked like they'd almost died, like skeletons now. And they looked at each other and they were shocked. They said, we almost died from this terrible snow that came upon us, the terrible winter. 
that lasted for much longer and gave us so much snow, it covered everything and we couldn't move and we must do something about this. The people say that there are five snow brothers, five giants that live up in the sky world and they make the snow. And the people said, we must go to the sky world before next winter and make sure the five snow brothers do not come together and snow in the same place. That's what happened here. They all snowed at the same place and almost killed us. Now the animals, they had had a very hard winter too, just like the people and the animals heard. And they said, we will go with you people because we know it's important that it never snow like that again. So the animals and people agreed before the next winter, they would go to the sky world and stop the five snow brothers. Well, winter was coming. It was fall, just like around now. And, and the people said, well, we said we have to go to the sky world to stop the snow brothers, those giants from snowing upon us. But how can we get to the sky world? And the people talked and thought and argued. They realized what they would try to do is shoot arrows into the sky. And those arrows would stick to one another and create a long chain that people and the animals could climb up to the sky world. This is their plan. So all the people came together, all the humans, and they began to shoot their arrows up into the sky. And their arrows go up, 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 and then they would come down. They shoot again and again and again, up, 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 and then come back down. None of these arrows could, could strike the sky to build this chain of arrows they were trying to make. Then the animals came forward. All the animals, bear, wolf, all the big animals came forward and they were shooting their bows and their arrows up into the sky and they would do the same thing going up and up and then coming back down. No one could shoot an arrow into the sky. Well, a little bird named Chickadee came forward and he was holding a little bow made from the elk bone of it, excuse me, the rib bone of an elk. And he said, let me try. And everyone laughed at him. Oh, little Chickadee, no way. There's no way you can do it. You're so small and tiny, you can't do it. But little chickadee said, let me try. And he got an arrow. Now they didn't know his bow, his rib bone, elk bow was very powerful. He took an arrow, he shot into the sky and that arrow went all the way up and stuck into the sky. Then he took another arrow, shot it to the sky. It went up and stuck to the bottom of the first arrow. Then he shot another, stuck to the bottom of the third, second arrow. All the way, he kept shooting arrows until now he had created a long chain of arrows coming from the sky all the way and it touched the earth. Now this chain of arrows was not strong enough to hold people or animals. They needed to make it bigger. And so woodpecker came and woodpecker began to fly around that chain of arrows made it with their wooden shafts. And he flew around them singing his song. And as he was singing that those shafts of those arrows, those wooden shafts, they began to swell and get bigger and bigger and bigger until they were the size of a, a tree trunk. So you now had a tree trunk growing from the earth all the way to the sky world. And then Woodpecker and his friend Yellowhammer came forward and using their beaks, they began to pound and hammer steps into that ladder all the way up to the sky world. So now they had the way into the sky world. And so all the people began to climb up that ladder heading to the sky world. All the animals were climbing up the ladder heading to the sky world. Everyone was going. Now there was a little animal named Rat. You know who Rat is. And Rat said, I want to go. And he tried to climb and they pushed him away. Little rat, go on. You're so small. You're so tiny. There's no way you can help us. And you'd get in the way. We'd step on you. And you're a dirty little animal anyway, rat. You stay here. And they chased him away. But rat was angry. He wanted to go up there and help, but they wouldn't let him. So he was angry. Well, the people got to the sky world. The animals were going. A little rat began to very carefully, very quietly follow them, going up each step, heading to the sky world. When they got to the sky world, the people looked around, they traveled and the animal traveled with them and they finally came to a giant house covered in snow and ice and they knew this was the house of the five snow brothers. But it was getting dark and the people and animals knew that they could not fight the snow brothers in the dark. They would wait till the morning. When the morning came up, when the morning sun came up, they would attack the house of the snow brothers and make them agree not to snow in one place anymore. But they knew they would probably end up fighting the snow brothers who were giants. And they had terrible weapons. And the people and the animals knew this would be a terrible battle. And many would be hurt, many might be killed, but they had to do it. They had to stop the Snow Brothers. Well, they decided to make a camp that night and wait for the sun to rise. And so they did, and they went to sleep waiting for the sun to rise so they could attack the house of the Snow Brothers. But who should appear but Little Rat? Little Rat came very quietly, very late, but he came. And then he saw everyone, and he saw the house, and little rat went to the giant house and he crept in the house. And sure enough, in that giant house were five giant beds, each brother sleeping in their own bed. And next to each brother's bed was 
a bow, a giant bow with a bowstring. They were always ready to fight. A little rat went to the first brother's bed and went to the bow and using his sharp little claws and teeth, he bit and scratched and bit and scratched until that bowstring broke. Then he went to the next brother's bed and did the same thing, biting and scratching, biting and scratching until that bowstring broke. Then he went to the next brother, that bowstring broke, the next brother, that bowstring broke. And he was going to bite and chew the last bowstring of the last brother's arrow, a bow, but the sun came up and the people and the animals now were yelling and they were, they were yelling and attacking, running toward the house of the snow brothers. The snow brothers heard the people and animals coming, a battle, and they liked that. And they reached for their big bows to fight the battle. And they, the four brothers realized their bowstrings were broken. Their bows were useless. They couldn't fight. The fifth brother and the four other brothers, they gave up. We can't fight. We have no weapons to fight you with. So they gave up to the people and animals. And the people and the animals said to the five snow brothers, you must never snow in the same time again like you did last year. You almost wiped out the earth and all living things, creating that, that winter that covered everything with ice and snow. You must never do this again. From now on, you may only go to different parts of the sky world one brother at a time, and you may snow there, one brother snowing in one place. You may only do that. If you break this promise, we will come back and we'll destroy you. And so the Snow Brothers agreed. They would never do that again. And so if you look at the world we live in now, when it snows here, um, does it snow for days and days and days like some parts of the country? No, it doesn't. Usually one or two days. Does the snow get very deep? Very seldom does it get up to our knees, right? And if it does, we freak out. Um, nobody can drive, apparently, in that kind of snow. Um, and so, and does it get below zero? Of course not, it doesn't. It hardly gets uh, into the teens in our winters. So again, we have what we call a relatively mild winter here. And we acknowledge that came because of the work of the people. The work of the people, a long time ago, in this mystic story, arranged this is how the world will be. Our winters will be mild. The winters will no longer threaten to destroy us and the world because of this story. And so again, um, how do you connect that old, old story to the world we live in? How do you connect that old, old story and some of the things it teaches to the modern world that we live in? Can we? Is there anything about this story that seems modern to you? And um, again, if you have any thoughts and you wanna share them on, on um, chat, that'd be wonderful. But I'm gonna mention one thing that, um, is mine. Whenever I share what I find in the story, that's just Roger. Okay, get this. This is only Roger sharing what he thinks the story is about. You are not Roger. So you might think totally different things about this story than I do. You could go all the way, you know, from, from, I don't, that story's crazy. I don't understand it at all, all the way to, it reminds me of another story that sounds very similar from another culture. And it teaches this and this and this, or this is the one thing I found, whatever it is. Um, so your thoughts about this story, your feeling about the story are important. They're important to me and they should be important to you as well. These things tell you about uh, how you see the world. So, but as, as I, because when I tell the stories, I told you I know them by heart, right? I, they just flow out of me. I don't even think about it. I'm an autopilot. I'm just telling the story, which means I can think about all kinds of things in the meantime while I'm telling the story. Um, and once I was telling the story not long ago, maybe a year, year and a half ago, and I said, okay, so the story says the people were trapped in their houses by this winter, this snowfall that turned the world into a, a world of snow and ice and cold. And is anything like that happening in my life right now? And I said, well, the pandemic protocols at the time were stay in your house, don't go anywhere. Um, if you uh, think you're sick, stay in the house and don't go anywhere. If you want to avoid the virus, stay in your house. So I said, I feel this story is kind of telling me something about what's happening in my life right now, that pandemic. And then I started going with that thought, following paths of understanding and, and my own logic and my feelings. And that if this story, if the snow could be the, uh, uh, a metaphor for the pandemic and it covers the earth and we're all afraid that it might destroy us next time, um, then what have I learned? What could have, well, how did they solve the problem? Everyone together. They didn't send a hero, one person to go up to the sky world to take care of their problem. Everyone went together. Men, women, children, elders, animals, everyone went together. So again, if we have this huge problem that affects all of us, then we must all be involved in the solution of the problem, finding the solution and acting on the solution. Again, that's Roger 
thinking aloud for you, what you might think. Um, again, if you want to share on, on, on chat, that'd be wonderful. Um, so when I heard that part about, I, I correlated the, connected the, that snow trapped in your houses with coronavirus trapped in my house. And then I said, so what else is this story trying to tell me then? Because it's not about the snow and it's not about viruses. It's about humans and their life in the world to we, the way, the way I look at it. And so I said, well, they solved it together. So whatever this virus is, we have to solve it together. We must use the language of we and not I. And this is my political opinion. It's so it's not like I, my rights supersede the welfare of the community. Um, it has to be a we thing. And um, let's see, I'm gonna look for chat and see if anybody's written some thoughts down here. Hold on a sec. And I think uh, the one that everyone has a role to play, I think if you look at this story in totality, um, there's not heroes, but there's certain, certain beings that have a pivotal role in the story. And who are the pivotal ones? Who got everyone to the sky world? A little chickadee, a little bird. Not the big people, not the big animals, not a little tiny bird with his little bow was able to solve the problem, a little one. And then uh, getting to the sky world and, 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 and preventing the battle was a little rat, a little rat. So um, sometimes, our focus is on the big changes and the big changes that need to take place and we hope take place and we want to take place, but sometimes it's just the littlest things. And I think someone is saying that, the smaller animals like rat who had a big role. And so again, sometimes we in this culture feel that we're insignificant. I'm only one voice and I don't have much of a voice because I don't have any political power, any money or, or any you know status among those people who make our decisions for us, that kind of thing. Um, but it reminds me that every little voice is important. We must hear every voice. And um, sometimes that little voice is the one that is actually gonna hold the answer, the solution that we all agree on. This is the answer, this is what we're looking for. Um, so again, for me then, this story hopefully leads you to see that these stories are philosophy, philosophy. And um, they are descriptions of how the world works. Well. In my opinion, the way I define it, these stories, like these mythic stories in philosophy, they explain how the world came to be, they explain how the world works, and they explain how you live in that world in a good way. Those are kind of the basic foundational parts of these mythic stories. This is how the world came to be, this is how it works, and this is how you live in the world. And that helps anyone living in that culture. My, my stories, my people tell me in the stories, this is how I live in the world in a good way. So. Um, Right now, I think that uh, the native stories are the oldest stories that humans still tell. Um, and in that regard, I think they have a depth that we sometimes underestimate. But I, again, I don't mean to, to be lecturing you, you know, like, uh, like an old grandpa that I am. You, you know what your problem is? You know, you better listen to me now, um, that kind of thing. I, but I do hope that you recognize that storytelling is a powerful way of teaching a powerful way of communicating. Um, so, you know, that part I said where how the world came to be, how the world works and how I live in that world. Well, let's take the idea of a world in mythic and dream language. Your life is a world and the world is your life. And so if I am um, thinking that question, how did my life come to be? How does my life work? And how do I live that life in a good way? that I can get along with other people in the world itself. So again, you begin to expand your consciousness. And that's the thing that I think is powerful in storytelling. It allows each person to become philosophical. It allows each person to connect with the wisdom of their people and their ancestors. And without that, um, I don't believe you're as grounded as you can be. So right now, what stories do we live by? There are, uh, there's a wonderful book I read and I reread it recently. It's called Six Myths to Live By. Um, and by a woman mythologist, and she points to, we do live by myths right now. We live by mythic stories that we tell all the time. Like there's a mythic story that uh, you must kill the monster. And um, it came out of the idea, of, she, she points to the book Frankenstein, that the monster was not coming from the forest or under the ocean. It was created in a laboratory. We humans created that monster. So what's our response to that monster when it gets out of control? Well, we destroy it. 
right? That's what we're supposed to do. So she follows that arc of that story about destroying the monster where many cultural stories, the monster is turned into mosquitoes. Still a problem, but not as big as they're gonna kill you. Um, or the monster is moved to another place from a forest into the water, into the ocean, or a monster is put to sleep or a monster becomes a friend or a monster, whatever it is, you don't have to destroy the monster because the world is full of monsters, terrible things we don't truly understand. And we don't quite, can't quite explain where they came from, but we know we gotta do something about them. They're scary and they're very harmful. So again, monster stories are wonderful ways of getting an insight to a culture. Um, she also had one that says, boys will be boys. That's a story we go by. Boys are just these men or just these kind of unexplicable beings that live in the world that can do really good things or really terrible things. And that, um, but we cut them slack when we say boys will be boys. We cut them slack and say, well, that's just how they are. Instead of understanding, we can nurture boys, we can teach boys, we can um, sensitize them to being like in the story of a salmon boy. This boy can be a good kid. He can get along with people, but he has to go through an experience that will help him understand that here, not just in his brain, but here. So um, again, those stories then, does that story about the five snow brothers uh, it resonated for me because I was able to connect it very quickly to the pandemic, a virus. And if you think about us being snowed in, well, one little flake of snow is not going to flow me in, but billions of them covering the earth. Um, now we're talking about something different. And one little virus is not going to, you know, probably do as much damage as the world covered in viruses and the virus keep multiplying. So um, these stories then are meant to help us understand something. And this also, you have to step back and say, wait a minute, here's a mythic story and a belief that Western culture seems to portray all the time, that we are a mind and a body, and that's our totality, a mind and a body, and that's pretty much it. But for many native cultures, you're much more complex than that. You're a mind, a powerful mind, and a powerful body, but you also have a, a spirit that I oftentimes point to here, your heart, because your spirit, everyone defines it in their own way, but you have a, a, a life force, if you will, that connects you with everything, but also separates you from everything at the same time. It's kind of a powerful schism there. Um, but you also have an emotional being. You're an emotional being. And I point to my stomach there because for many cultures, that's a source of your emotion. They come from your, your stomachs. So, um, Native people say, so you're a little bit more complicated than just a mind and body. You also have a spirit and you also have a, a, um, a uh, emotional being of who you are. And what's challenging is to find balance for all those four things. They must be in balance with each other. They and if they're not in balance, then you're out of balance and everything can just tip over and fall over. So what work do we do to make sure our mind and body are covered in Western culture? But what work can we do to make sure our emotional um, being is a part of, we factor that into our well-being and what about our spirituality? And so um, spirituality and religion are two different things to me. So when I mention spirituality, I'm not talking about religion. To me, religion is how you practice your spirituality, but um, I'm not gonna get into that discussion because that's way over my head. You, the other people might know better than that. Um, so these stories then that our people tell are philosophical. And a lot of what Western culture had been doing for a long time is assuming because native people couldn't read and write. Um, they had not developed that technology. Um, and they also had these strange beliefs Western culture didn't understand and these same strange ways of life that they were inferior then therefore they had nothing to teach us, nothing that they can teach us. And so therefore, when we presented our philosophies and our stories, the stories were dismissed as being not true, as being inconsequential, as being kind of like crazy dreams or little kid things to tell little kids, but they had no place in the world. And, um, I'm here to tell you, I've been using these stories for 40 years and they have helped me strike a balance. I still, if you forget the balance, it can fall apart. You, you, your life becomes um, more chaotic. So um, again, I want to double check with the instructor. Did you want any time for any question answers or did you want me to tell another story or how do you, what do you think? Let's see, let's give people a minute or so. Do you want to raise a hand and ask a question, anybody? Or put one in the chat for Roger? He loves questions. So, and the harder the question, the better. <laughs> Put in the form of true or false, make it easy for me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think you told us that may not be the right kind of question to ask. <laughs> question in the chat, how do you get people to listen? 
you know, I just had a, it just, it was just an interesting um, um, discussion. And I applied to do, I, I've been doing storytelling with people that are struggling with drug and alcohol addiction and mental health issues. Um, I've been at prisons. I've tell stories at prisons. I've told people in, in um, juvenile justice centers where the bad juvie kids, the little salmon boys and women and other kids are sent when they do bad things. And, and I've never, this, this proposal said, have you ever presented to groups um, that you needed to, um, um, have you ever had to deal with unruly or, or um, uh, groups that are uh, 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 angry or upset? People going into treatment centers are upset because they're trying to create a whole new life and they're struggling and they, anyway. And I look back and I honestly could say I've never had a problem in sharing a story um, with people. And how do you get people to listen? I think there, there's something, this sounds weird. And again, a lot of storytelling stuff and art stuff, I'm an artist too, they sound weird to the modern mind because we're so brain centered. We don't know how to factor in other things into our education, in my opinion. Um, but when you um, say these words, there's actually was a study done, either in the European way, um, um, once upon a time, or if you say it in the native way, a long time ago, something about those words strikes a chord in people and they, they can breathe and they can drop, drop their shoulders and relax and listen. And so it's just a powerful um, understanding that we people are not just enjoy stories and, and benefit from stories. We actually are hardwired. If you're going to use the modern terminologies, we're hardwired for stories. We need stories to understand powerful concepts that our brain can't quite can't quite make sense of. And again, we live in a, a culture that <laughs> the, one of the huge shifts in Western culture was uh, that guy who said, uh, "I think, therefore I am." My brain establishes everything. And that's the proof of my existence is my brain is able to. And I'm a little kid who I remember I heard that and I said, OK, well, that's cool. But can you go the other way, too? I am. Therefore, I think. Um, but again. We have powerful brains and we, our stories talk about that. And I was going to close with a quick story that maybe refers to that. I try not to get too literal. Can you tell a story about this or about that? And I'm like, well, I could kind of tell you a whole bunch of stories and you would connect the topic with that story. My job is not necessarily, to, well, let me find a story that'll connect with your topic. It goes the other way. You connect your topic with this story. And I think that that um, um, <laughs> makes the job easier on the storyteller, but it just seems to pan out over and over and over again. If I were talking about drug and alcohol abuse, I would tell the story of the five snow brothers because a great snow has changed their world the addiction has changed their world and now they're trapped by their addiction. We're trapped in their home. And to get rid of that condition, to struggle with that addiction successfully, we need to work together. And we must go to a higher place. We must go to a higher place to solve this problem. And what is a higher place? Again, I'm gonna leave that to you to determine. What is a higher place? And so when we work together and don't forget the little things that will help us solve that problem. So again, um, if I were asked, okay, Roger, these are a bunch of students that are working on their uh, counseling degrees, to, uh, drug and alcohol addictions, I would have told the five snow brothers. It allows me to talk about those things, but it allowed me to talk about coronavirus and talk about, about the concept of the hero. It allowed me to talk about a lot of things, topics. Not that I'm trying to lecture you, but at least open the door for those conversations. Okay. So, Maybe yeah. have one, one more okay. Question. Sure. And then if you do have a final story, that would be a great way to close. Jeffrey has had his hand uh, up. Rene Descartes. Do I say it right? Is, 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 is that I say it right? Anyway. Um, yeah. And again, it's a powerful philosophical statement that, that was accepted by a whole culture. Jeffrey, go ahead. So let me tell you a short little quick story, and I'm telling it for a reason. We're going to have a discussion about this story because I want you to know that that's your job now. My job is to tell the story. Your job is to say, oh, why did he tell that story? What's that story about? Why did, why did that character do that? And why didn't they do this? And what does that tell me about this culture that tells this story? And just all kind of, your work has begun. My job is done. And the fact that I try to add more progress or more, not progress, but more um, elements to understanding stories because 
Um, I read a line and I actually wrote it down in a report that I was doing. And it said, before you believe the story, you must believe in story. So if I tell you a story, but you don't believe in stories, then you're not going to get anything from it. But if I tell you, well, look in the story, here's let's just talk about a few things we can see. And now do you understand what stories can do? And now let me tell you a story. And I'm hoping that it will help you to connect the idea that these stories are much, much com more complex than we imagine. Any story I've told you so far, there are tons of other perspectives people will bring that will be equally valid to anything that I might have mentioned or whatever you mentioned. So again, how do we embrace that diversity of, of, of interpretation of story and philosophy? So this story then is... Uh, um, about a character, his name is Coyote. And Coyote is a trickster. And a trickster is usually someone in the mythic stories of a culture that is so smart and bold that they play tricks on people, that they do sometimes really good things and sometimes really bad things, and they don't care because they're so smart and they, they're, they're very fluid in the way that they live. And Coyote is one of those. Raven up north here is probably more like Mink or Blue Jay, but... Um, to the east of us is Coyote. Coyote is always in, in being stories and books being written about him. He's so powerful. But um, Coyote is a trickster. He plays tricks on people and he's very smart. Um, he seems to be amoral. It's not that he's good or bad. He just doesn't care. He just does what he wants to do. Um, and sometimes people say, that sounds a lot like my, uh, my brother-in-law, Curtis, or whatever it is. You know. And then if you get really honest, that sounds like me. All right. <laughs> but again, that's kind of like, is he a, uh, an alter ego of us, of us humans? Because we're capacity, we have powerful brains. We have the capacity to do really wonderful things. And we also have the capacity to do very terrible things. And which are we? Well, we're all of the above. How do we come to grips with that? Well, let me tell you some coyote stories. So here's a coyote story, big trickster. A long time ago, Coyote was standing in the middle of a field, in the middle of a forest, in the sunshine. He was scratching himself. He was just having a good time. The day was nice. It was all sunny. And his friend Badger, you know, Badger, that little kind of like digging bear. Well, Badger appeared and Badger came up and said, Coyote, why are you so smart? And uh, Coyote said, what are you talking about, Badger? And Badger said, well, all the animals, we all got together and we agreed you're the smartest of all the animals. Why are you so smart? Coyote thought for a minute. He says, well, because I eat smart berries. Badger says, smart berries? What are smart berries? Coyote said, those are the berries you eat that make you smarter. Duh. Badger said, well, I want to be smart. Where are those berries? I want to eat some. Coyote said, I don't think so. They're really powerful. They're very potent. Ah, you just couldn't handle them, Badger. But Badger starts to beg and plead. Oh, please, Coyote, I can do it. I know I can do it. I know I, I want to be smart like you. Please, Coyote, I, I can do it. Show me the berries. I Coyote let him beg for a little while. Then Coyote said, all right, come with me. And Coyote led Badger into the woods. And they followed some trails for a long, long, long ways out into the woods. And right by the trail was this big bush. And all around the ground at the bottom of that bush were these little brown pellets. And Coyote pointed at those little brown pellets. He says, those are the smart berries. And Badger jumps down. He starts stuffing them in his mouth, eating as many as he can. Om, nom, 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 nom. And he stops, he goes, Coyote, these aren't berries. This is, these are rabbit droppings. This is rabbit poop. What are you doing? And Coyote said, don't you feel smarter already? And that is all the story called Coyote and the Smart Berries. So um, for me then, I love that little story because it takes me off in different directions. I can talk about jokes and humor and predictions. I can talk about Coyote's nature. I can talk about Badger's nature. Um, but with little kids, I tell these stories to little kids. Kids love poop stories, so don't worry. It's, I'm not corrupting them, all right? But anyway, um, when I shared it with little kids or young kids, I said, oh, what did you learn from that story? Um, and kids will, a lot of kids will invariably say what? Little kids will say, why wasn't Badger happy being Badger? Why did he want to be like Coyote? Which is a really wonderful question. Why do I want to be like LeBron James or or... Luka Doncic, why do I want to be like them? You know, they play basketball, I play, I do my own thing, but I want to be like them. Or why do I want to be like Noam Chomsky and research the heck out of the topic? And why do, why do I want to be like uh, 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 Bill Frank Sr., who 
change this whole culture because of his leadership and the fishing rights struggles of the past 40 years? I mean, why? What's wrong with me? And again, good question. Why don't I just want to be like me? So why did Badger want to be like Coyote? That's where I start to think. You have to think, what did Badger want? Why did he want? And how did he allow Coyote to play a big trick on him and end up with a mouthful of rabbit poop? Again, um, that story, I could talk about addiction too with that because addiction sometimes feels like you got a mouthful of stuff and you don't know how it got there and you want to spit it out and you want to never do that again. But something compels you. So again, um, I hope you understand then that these stories are open to interpretation and that is a good thing, that your interpretation is equally valid to anything I've shared with you in my position. Um, but what stories do you know from your culture? Um, unfortunately, um, I hate to do this because I'm never quite sure what kind of education you've had. The classic education of most of the adults that are older people, excuse me, not just adults, but older people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, like maybe your instructors are, um, and me, that we were educated in a certain way and we came away from our educational learning, whatever it was in school or culture or television or whatever it was, we came away with some things that we learned. Like I'm gonna ask you uh, just to think about this, don't worry about responding, um, uh, just think about your answer. I'm gonna give you a line from a story. You give me the next line, all right? And the wolf said, little pig, little pig, let me in. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, right? Most of you knew that. You didn't have to think about it because that story's in your heart. It just came right out of you. You heard that story so many times. You loved it so many times that now you can just respond, right? Little pig, little pig, let me in. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. That makes sense. Here's one for the theater people or just anyone who pays attention in high school, all right? I'll give you the line, you give me the next line. To be or not to be? That is the question. All right, you got that one down too. You didn't have to think about it, you didn't have to Google it, you didn't have to you know, drag out a book or anything. You just knew that because you'd heard it, what, so many times, you just know it. And in American history, there is a line, and I hate to do it because there's see, it seems to be losing its power, but, I'm going to give you a line from modern American history dealing with Native American people. The only good Indian. And all the adults, the older adults know what that response is. They don't want to say it. They don't believe it. But there it is. You didn't have to think about it, but it's in your heart. And so the stories we know we carry in our heart, those are the ones that I think we need to always look at. What are the stories I carry in my heart? And what does my culture tell me by telling me these stories? So again, I... I um, appreciate you guys letting me come and, and share a couple of these Coast Salish stories with you. Uh, the tribes around here, stories that reinforce their connection with the environment and uh, the way that they shape their culture gives us another clue about that. Salmon and cedar. If you know salmon and cedar, you know a lot about our people, but it goes more, much more deeper than that. Salmon and cedar are not just resources. They're teachers, they're guides, they're models for our behavior. They're much, much more than just a thing that we use as a so again if you remember right in the beginning i put my hands up like this that said thank you this is what our salish people do here thank you thank you put up our hands to people i want to say hockinson yam to your teachers for pulling this together asking me to do this putting my hands up to you for allowing me to share these stories and for sharing some of your thoughts about the stories um i hope to see you all again and um again thank you to your your instructors and uh uh Hopefully, you know, you'll look into the stories of your own culture and even the culture of your ancestors. Go back and find out who's my great, 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 great grandmother. What stories did she, what stories did she tell? What stories did her culture tell her? Because that line of stories might be lost, but it's not gone. And I hope that you will recognize that if I tell the story of my great, 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 great grandmother, um, she'll be happy and I'll be happy too. And I'll learn something in the, in the, in the, in the doing of that act. All right. So again, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. I hope to see you all again. Thank you, Roger. That was, as always, great. Um, you are an incredibly vivid storyteller. Um, story and drama, I think, as you indicate, are just go hand in hand. Um, we're going to stick around a little while in case any students, in fact, want to. You're certainly welcome to do that, too. But a lot of them need to wind up and head off somewhere. So we'll let them do that. John, we can stop recording, I think, now.